The Michael Hatfield Remax team presents Real Estate and More. Bay Area real estate is different than in all of America. And why? What's up with home buyers? What's on sellers' minds? How is the market? And much, much more. Now, here's your host, Michael Hatfield. Welcome to our show and thanks for tuning in. We have an incredibly interesting show today and not many people are as well qualified to speak on the subject as our guest today. He's a return guest, a very good friend of ours. He is 37 year fire battalion chief on the peninsula, a man who's currently in charge of nine stations and 40 firefighter personnel and chief novelli comes from a family of service to the community joe continues to give back to the community through serving as the co-founder of the future fire leaders organization and welcome back battalion chief joe novelli thanks michael great to be back with you oh it is hey uh it's been a while since we've talked it was the uh, 9 11 show you were on uh, talking about the services that our local fire departments provided yes. to help assist with the uh, 9 11 uh, uh, 2001 event in New York City. So it's been a little while since we've been talking, but it, it's always a pleasure to see you and and talk about such things. But today we have a very interesting topic that uh, I can't wait to get to. So it's, it's good to speak with you again. Yeah, excited to be back here with you and share some things. Absolutely. Well, let's go with uh, talking about uh, your background, what you been doing for a number of years and I know how many years you long know time. Long, long time, time. and uh, what you do now what your uh, your actual focus is and you know we'll take it from there yeah so I as mentioned I'm the youngest of five in a family that's been very involved uh, in community service as you've mentioned uh, so I first got involved with the fire service back in 1985 and uh, that was my mom's suggestion after raising four other kids and kind of seeing our strengths and weaknesses mom was the one that originally said hey I think you should look into the fire service and the interesting thing there was um, n n I had no uncles no siblings nobody I knew was in the fire service so um, back in 1986 87 worked for Cal Fire and then was hired with uh, the organization I work for now uh, in 1988 and I've been still there and still an active battalion chief working operations as we speak yeah i recall our our talk with the 9 11 show and it had to deal with the guys that went back and serviced uh it, you know the community of of new york when when the disaster happened in 2001 it was also uh interesting to me because i've never been involved in anything like that you know pilots don't get involved in that kind of a stuff and that's what i was doing back at the time so to speak but uh you've um, always been very helpful with coming forward with uh, information that our listeners may be interested in and you know today's uh, subject is uh, something that everybody should be interested in our homeowners our community our people that live here it's just so very important you don't need water or food until you need it and you don't need help until you need it sure. and then when you do disaster services or a 9-11 call is usually where you go for so you know you've been involved with that for some time tell us a little bit about the 9-11 um, call services that we have here in the Bay Area if you would be so kind yeah and, and a lot's changed from back in 1985 till now even with the services uh, the call centers and even the services that these folks will get in the greater Bay Area. Um, the 911 system is is robust. It's um, you know they've they've instituted you, you know your ability to call 911 through your cell service now. Used to be home and now um, your cell calls will be routed to the proper agency. Um, yeah, so it, I, if I can, Michael, I thought I'd get into some of the services we provided then mm -hmm. and what people can expect now. Absolutely. Right? For, Please do. So statistically, for a lot of people, they won't call 911. It's it's a very difficult number to come up with because you could take the, the, the sheer population in the United States and then you can kind of do some arithmetic, which I'm not really good at. But, you know, it, it's kind of an odd thing to come up with. But what we've... What I've realized in the 37 years at my agency and almost 40 years overall is a lot of people will never call 911. And when they do, most are shocked to learn how many services are available for them. Um, so back in 87, when we first got hired, uh, I was a new recruit and uh, I was uh, 
welcomed very graciously by the department because I was this new kid out of the block that had this title called an EMT. I was an emergency medical technician. And so when I showed up, we had a tackle box, literally a fishing tackle box with some uh, first aid gear. And we had an oxygen container and we'd show up uh, to medicals and and provide service. Uh, To give the listeners perspective what's changed, Back in 87, 88, uh, and don't quote me on the exact number, but we ran roughly 1,000 to 1,100 calls for the entire year for our organization. And just recently, at the end of 2023, we're running over 19,000 calls. Mm. And so one would think, hmm, has that, has your population gone up 19-fold? Mm-hmm. Well, and we haven't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it hasn't. I think it's gone up by twenty thousand people over all those years. So the bigger question is what what has changed in the need and the calling of nine one one for service. But if you're okay, I'd like to kind of get into please go what yeah. people can expect. So for a lot of people, when you call nine one one, I want them to feel comfortable with what to expect, especially some of the younger folks out there that are listening and maybe some of us are getting a little older like myself or, or even a bit older like like my mom and such um so when you call 911 the first thing you're going to do is you're going to be uh, the call is going to be answered by one of two folks right uh, maybe three uh, a local police agency it might get routed to them and then they reroute that to the dispatch center that's going to serve for your needs maybe it's if we're talking about fire service uh, or you might go through a chp call center that they receive it through your cell phone because so many of us use our cell phones and then they'll go ahead and reroute that as well and oftentimes i want your listeners to to um to be comfortable with hearing a couple voices on the background so you know if they answer your call they're going to transfer that to another call center they're all staying on there to make sure that call doesn't get dropped and then another call taker will come up and go hey what's your emergency okay so once they do that they're going to give you a list of questions to try to determine what's taking place, what is your emergency, what have you witnessed, right? It could be, and we'll get into the type of services if you want later on, but they're gonna ask you a whole bunch of questions. Now, I don't want them to think that's a delay in service. Oftentimes, your your address will come up, or if you give a stated address, they're typing in this information as that's being received, and oftentimes, they're punching out that particular engine company or fire station, even the ambulance company, to get them up alert. Amazing. Yeah, it's 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 all based on time frames, right? And so um, that's how the 911 system takes place. I'd love to kind of discuss what they can expect as people arrive, right? Because oftentimes we're like, okay, I see this fire engine and most of them are yeah. red and they're very clean more often than not, which we require. <laughs> but I want people to expect, uh, to understand what can they expect as these folks pull in mm-hmm. and Go ahead. I have a I, I have a question. Um, there's a um, San Ramon and Valley uh, has a, a apparently a change in policy. If they have, they they actually try to determine first: do they call the police or do they call the fire department first? And before a lot of the calls were going to the police, the police were having to respond. But now they've changed their program to where the fire department is responding first in a lot of those occasions. Is there a move towards that where you are in the peninsula? Yeah, that, I think there is because I think just like our call numbers have gone up. I think that the services for for the police agencies has gone up as well and so i think that's based on individual cities but uh one of our cities that we provide service for has a police officer that shows up to every call mm-hmm. but the other two cities don't and, and i don't know if that's a a drawdown on the number of calls they got or that's just an individual city policy but i think it's going to be really dependent on where you live um, and that would be nice to know Uh, But it's really dependent on what city you work in. And like you said, the dispatcher, how they're going to determine what are the needs. Is there a a, a call that's violent in nature? Is somebody um, maybe uh, challenging with, uh, are they confused? And so they'll send PD out there as well to assist Mm. with the fire service. Mm. So nowadays, um, when the call comes in, it's actually assessed. And they can say, well, you know, this is a fire in this area on Maple Street. And they're actually punching in a number for the fire department to respond with the appropriate uh, uh, closest department. Is that how that works? Yes. Yeah. Wow. So they'll plug in their address, that <laughs> and it's all automated. 
they'll, they'll even do what's called a type code. So if it's a particular fire or a vehicle accident or medical, it'll come up with who's responsible to respond. And then it's all automated to go ahead and hit that dispatch system. It alerts us whether we're on the air driving around doing inspections or in quarters, it alerts them. Um, and so, you know, I do want to say this in a great example of what your your fire service is providing nowadays and certainly changes that we've we've experienced, I've experienced. To give you an example uh, that's really uh, descriptive, I think, that people can, can connect with, there are 56 fire stations in the county that I work with, which is the peninsula. And it's very similar in East Bay, North Bay, South Bay. Uh, there's 56 stations. Each one of those stations has a fire engine in it. And each one of those stations, for the most part, has a paramedic firefighter on that fire engine. So we provide kind of what we consider as an all risk service delivery system, certainly in the greater Bay Area. So when that call comes in, our, our goal, and certainly council members and, and, and the fire chiefs and the EMS folks, we wanna get there as soon as we can. And so there's standards, right? For our industry, it's, it's less than seven minutes. We wanna, from the time the call comes in to the time we get on scene. Wow. So to, to, to describe the changes that have taken place in the greater Bay Area, we are providing a robust service with paramedicine so we can deal with anything from any medical call from a broken arm to a heart attack to shortness of breath. And we have all the medications and the ability to, to, to put an airway into your throat like they do at the hospital, administer morphine or different drugs to kind of address that. But I want to hit this number. There are 56 stations in the county that have paramedics now. Uh -huh. So 20 years ago, they didn't but now they have paramedics on every engine company. So the level of service that are being provided to the general public, be it at your home or work or freeway, is significantly different. Now, any time in that same county, there could be nine to 12, nine to 13 ambulances that are gonna transport those people from your house to the hospital. So the difference is glaring, right? Nine to 12 versus 56. Now we work in conjunction with each other, but you can see just the sheer number of available fire engines with paramedics is significant. And that really benefits all of us because you're getting that, that, that trained personnel with all those medications to show up in a lot quicker time than before. Now I should say this and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let me talk. I'll let, I'll, go, I'll let you continue the show. Uh, it, it is really interesting where, um, you know, uh, some cities provide transport, like you said, over here in San Ramon. They have the firefighters and they have their own transport agency within their fire department. Others are contracted out. So it's really, it varies. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Michael, why choose an experienced agent? Complex issues arise in a home buy or sell. Your agent guides you through issues in multiple offer situations, first time home buyer needs, problems with inspections, financing, and escrow. Experienced agents sort and then solve problems. Do agents work differently now than in prior years? Buyers used to go to an office, thumb through a book, see pictures, then decide which homes to see. Nowadays, buyers identify properties themselves online so today's agent can focus on more critical priorities. How do you help clients, Michael? We work with investment properties, multiple offers, first-time home buyers, sellers, 1031 tax exchanges, and relocations. Experience is pivotal. Call 925-322-7775 now to schedule an appointment or complimentary home analysis. Call the Michael Hatfield Remax team at 925-322-7775 or go to michaelhatfieldhomes.com. The world of Bay Area real estate can be challenging. Buying, selling, renting, loan rates, and more. To help sort all that out, listen to Michael Hatfield hosts Real Estate and More, Saturday mornings at 9, right here on KGO 810 The Spread. Now, back to our show. I understand. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with 
Battalion Chief Joe Novelli, San Mateo, on the peninsula, in charge of a lot of the 9-11 emergency services, sharing with us today um, what he knows, which is considerable from his 37 years of experience and community service. Uh, so um, we'll continue on now. I have a question. Uh, what about the incident uh, response or the incident command system? How is that activated? Let's just say that some large scale event were to happen in the Bay Area and then, then you you get a call to 9-11. How and, and how is that determined? OK, well, this is going to require a large scale response, like a large earthquake mm-hmm. or a, a significantly large one other than, you know, someone passes out on the corner. How do, how's that determined? Yeah. And so it's a system that we use that people are trained on throughout the whole country. Right. It's called instant command system. And it, it really provides a um, almost like a pyramid of sorts where you have a, a group of people that are working. For us, it's a, a whole bunch of fire engines and ladder trucks and maybe ambulances that show up. And then at the top of that is the incident commander. And depending on the size of the call and depending on the availability of battalion chiefs like me that work in operations that are there 48 hours uh you know, two days on, four days off, and those shifts vary around the, the Barry as well. But depending on who shows up, somebody establishes themselves as the commander or incident command, and then everything kind of goes through them. The updates, what we're seeing, if you're saying like it's an earthquake and there's a significant building fire, there will be an incident commander that's pulling, pulling more resources in and then starts to kind of distribute and call for additional things, additional ambulances. I need a crane. I need um, six more fire engines. An earthquake's not the best example because, you know, that's going to be damaged throughout the whole community. I hope not too much, but um, a, a significant fire, wildland fire, a, a specific flood of sorts where it's isolated to a part of the city or town. That's where we could have, uh, go ahead and deploy that instant command system you're talking about. Yeah, I remember uh, the last time we were here, we were talking about the 9-11 and the response to that and the communications were not optimal. I imagine that's come a long way since uh, 9-11 uh, event back in 2001. Would, would you agree? I would, I would agree, yeah. There yeah. was lots of work and funding that went into uh, have uh, more agencies being able to talk to themselves on a you know a whole bunch of different channels, and so yeah, I think it has improved. I don't know if it's been tested since then, uh, but I know there's lots of uh, lots of programs and policies and technology that have been purchased to to kind of improve that. So you're right on top of that in what you do. Um, you're you're actually um, 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 I wouldn't say an administrator, but you're the actual manager of these disaster services in your area. I would think, and you would be uh, you would be one of the guys that would make the decision. Okay, well, do we activate the the large scale response, or is this just a local? Is, am I off on that? Or no, you're spot on. You okay. you are. And so uh, there's as mentioned, there's different ranks. There's the firefighters, and there's paramedics. There's typical what we call engineers, people that drive the fire engines or the big ladder trucks. And then you have a, a, a captain, like a lieutenant, that's in charge of a particular particular station. And then you have folks like me that are labeled battalion chiefs that are operational battalion chiefs. So we actually live with the men and women uh, that are on duty. And then we respond to calls and not the fancy fire engine or fancy truck. It's typically a you know, a, 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 an SUV of sorts or a, a truck, and then we'll take command. Now, as those events get bigger, um, then we're the ones that are calling for additional resources. What What's great about the Greater Bay Area is we have all those agreements in place, whether it's mutual aid where we can call for as many resources as we need. We can call for strike teams. We can call uh, for additional resources as this thing grows to, to ultimately help us to mitigate and protect life and property. And and and, and, and it's, it's been flexed here in California many times. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it started for me back in the Loma Prieta earthquake when I was on duty at Station 23 in, in 1989. And then we flexed that system as a real young man. Well, I remember uh, when the U.S. Airways 1549 lost both engines after a uh, well, complete power loss over the Hudson, mm-hmm. and they put their airplane in there. It took a while, uh, which is really a lesson for all of us, for the recognition of the captain in the seat to determine 
what did you really have? Because there'd never really been a full power loss like that. So he has to assess, well, can I get one back? Or can I not get one back? Can I make it to Teterboro? Can I get back to LaGuardia or somewhere like that? The recognition, the human factor right there is got to be a segment of time. So from the time that a call comes in from 9-11 to the time that it's being responded to, it has to be assessed very clearly. And that's why they need people like you, I imagine. Yeah, and it's it's always, uh, you know, the simulations that you have gone through, I'm sure for hours and hours and hours, oh, yeah. that that, pr- that uh, particular pilot went through, and we do the same thing, right? Uh, we're on, constantly troubleshooting, w- w- what do we see, what do we have, and we're gathering information from our folks through 911 calls, and and you know, it's, it's head on the swivel, and it's, um, as that information comes in, we continue to make decisions. Uh, again, f- focusing in on life safety and trying to get people removed from the building through ladders or interior searches and rescues, and so, yeah, it really depends on the information that's coming in. And the first 10 or 15 minutes of any incident in any town USA is the most challenging for folks in my position or first two officers like lieutenants and captains. They are on the ground trying to determine what's taking place. And there's methodologies that they use to do that. Mm-hmm. There's doing a, a 360 around a building and um, they're reading smoke. You know, one smoke condition looks completely different Very than another. And we mm-hmm. can determine how much energy is behind that smoke, color of smoke, which could really help us determine what is burning and how much power is behind that and how quickly that's spreading. So there's there's lots of details that we can go through that I'm sure you can yeah. as a pilot as well that's gonna help us determine that. Well, that assessment period is absolutely critical because with a an airliner, you have pages and pages of immediate response um, procedures and believe it or not you know some people think that these airplanes fly themselves but there is an element of a human factor in there that is absolutely critical you would not leave a machine oh well you know they talk a lot about artificial uh, intelligence nowadays but I, I I like the idea that there's a human person involved in making decisions well, well do I call out these other three companies or do I call the police or do I call out the military because if you recall correctly when we were talking about 9-11 there was one guy calling he says call out the military you remember that mm-hmm, we, were, and we, we were listening to the uh, communications during that show and so that human factor of being able to make those decisions quickly is something um, that you know you guys are underpaid for in my view yeah no and those that comes with time on the job and experiencing you know uh, multiple calls. Some people would describe it as this slide carousel you have in your in your head, right? And all these different experiences you've had. And, and after 39 years, I've, I've had a ton. I don't think it's ever enough. But when responding to the Loma Prieta earthquake, or I was at the Oakland Hills fire, or the Tubbs fire in Napa, or, or the Camp Fire in the Paradise, you know, I can go on and on through these list of fires that that I've responded to and taken significant crews to, you you learn a lot and it's catastrophic and it's sad and it's it's damaging and it creates scar tissue into your heart. But the flip side of that is I watch men and women make a huge difference with what we do. And 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 I, I might be alone in saying this, but I truly think it's one of the last lines of work where you walk into somebody's house and there's a significant amount of trust when you walk in Mm. and and i always stress that with our new hires with our company officers which are amazing people but we can't take advantage of that you have to realize when you're walking into somebody's home i think the trust factor continues to be amazing that they they know you're going to make something better Better, and they trust you right and because we're grounded with our service delivery model our business is delivering service and hope we know that that's what we do and we can't ever lose sight of that and as we hire new people we have to constantly have them see through those lenses that um, we can't ruin that and we have to honor that because it's a it's something that can be lost right away being a firefighter you're going to see a lot of things is there any are there any programs now to help with ptsd from seeing some of the things that they see you know that they see a lot and is there any better programs for firefighters to uh, help them when they deal with these uh, emotional type uh, situations there is and, and and sadly it 
it came about because of our, you know, in the fire service only. That's I, I, that's the only numbers I can speak to. Our our rate of suicides are, are has spiked. It has gone up tremendously, and it, it makes sense, Michael, when you think about 1,100 calls in 1988 and 19,000 calls a year. Now we're being exposed to a lot more trauma. Uh, and we're like as, as I mentioned, we're an all risk agency. You call nine one one for anything, we're responded to it. So we've always had what they call like EAP employee assistant programs, but now we have programs that are called Fire Strong. They're training uh, firefighters around the country to actually support others, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we have networks of. Um, resources available for them to call. I can talk to somebody that's a captain in a different city. I can share my struggles with a potential suicide call that I ran on or uh, you know, a, a, perhaps a baby that uh, didn't survive. I had that very early on. I had a SIDS death with a baby that I was doing CPR probably my first year and a half in and the baby didn't survive but I it's still impactful to me now mm-hmm. all these years later mm-hmm. and it's it's interesting to I still can't recall a certain section, um, a, a moment in time when I was running out with the baby into the ambulance and I was still doing CPR all the way to the hospital. I, I can't recall running out. I just, I don't. And so taking advantage of these services should no longer be considered weak or uh, not, uh, you know, uh, not manly or womanly to, to quote both sexes. Um, we want people taking advantage of it. And so, the International Association of Firefighters and local agencies, and certainly our our organization, has taken this head on, and um, and I think we're going to benefit from that long term. I really uh, do. Unbelievable! Yeah. It's so much a pleasure to have you on the show today. Is there some thoughts that you uh, would like to add to that to uh, help us conclude, uh, uh, Chief Novelli? No, I think it's just great. There's a few things that I wanted to share with with your your audience. Things that you can make a huge impact into the community. Uh, first and foremost. You know, get on whatever internet site that you you prefer and pull up what's called an automatic external defibrillator. Look at an AED. There's probably a three minute video on airplanes too. On airplanes too, mm-hmm. and you know th- you could have your your kids uh, in junior high all the way up to your mom. Look at how an AED works because that is a a piece of equipment that you're going to find at parks, on airplanes, in airports, malls. They're everywhere in restaurants and it can make a significant difference in somebody's life. And so it's an easy skill to learn. So that's the first thing I tell you to do. Second thing is continue to try to get CPR trained. And the last thing I would tell them to do is check your smoke detectors because the impact with a new battery in your smoke detector is is massive. It could save your family's life. And we've seen where people have taken them out and it doesn't mm-hmm. go well. So please take on those three challenges over the next couple of months to see if you can make a huge impact to your community. All very good, good things to know. And boy, we're so grateful that you came back on the show today and, and help us with these. We're gonna have to have you back and, and share some more as the time goes on. So thank you again for being on the show today, uh, Chief Novelli. Thank Appreciate you, Michael. it. Yeah, thanks for th- having me. Thank you, sir. Not many people are as well qualified to speak on fire and rescue as this man. It's time for a short break. You've been listening to Real Estate and More. Interesting people, important topics, and we do talk real estate. Listen to archive Real Estate and More shows at michaelhatfieldhomes.com slash radio. We'll be right back with our next special guest. Stay tuned. 